Did you know the most expensive house in the United States has 132 rooms, 35 bathrooms, three elevators with 55,000 square feet on 18 acres of land? According to Zillow, it has appreciated 15% since 2009 and is worth $400 million. Does anyone know which house this is? The White House. The White House. All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to On The Grind. I'm your host, Chirag T. Patel and the T is very important. Ladies and gentlemen, first and foremost, I want to welcome each and every one of you here tonight. Thank you for coming. You guys could have been anywhere in the world. You're here with me, and I really appreciate that. So thank you. Um, tonight, we got an awesome entrepreneur in the building. Um, I think a lot of you know Mark Spain. A lot of you met him, maybe met him for the first time tonight. I don't know if you guys really know his journey and how he has become one of the top real estate professionals in the country. He was named one of the top agents in the world by Remax and was inducted to the Hall of Fame of Remax. After joining Keller Williams, he was ranked the number one agent in the world out of close to 110,000. As an Atlanta native, Mark Spain and his team has ranked number one with the Atlanta Board of Realtors for over 11 consecutive years. The Wall Street Journal has ranked him consistently each year in the top 1% out of 1.1 million realtors in the country. Not only has he mastered the art of, art of the deal, but within the last year, he opened his own brokerage, Mark Spain Real Estate. In his first year as chairman of Mark Spain Real Estate, his company closed almost a half a billion in sales with 1,842 transactions. Inc. Magazine has ranked his company number 1350, fastest privately growing company in America. He is part of an exclusive club of realtors who has closed over 3 billion in real estate. It is known that less than 100 people have actually accomplished this feat. When he's not selling real estate or crushing it in the office or giving his competition a break, Mark spends his time giving back through the Mark Spain Foundation. He has partnered with the YMCA to work on projects that benefit families, veterans, and local communities. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mark Spain. Before we start, um, I have a friend in the real estate business, and you know, unfortunately, he couldn't be here. And I told him, you know, I'm interviewing Mark Spain today. You need to be here. We're going to learn some, you know, learn some new things. But he, I told him, you know what? I'll ask a question for you. And he sent me a question. It was, it's pretty off the wall, but I'll, I'll ask it. We'll just get it out of the way. He wants to know if you could be any animal in the world. <laughs> what animal would you be, and why? And you can't say a lion. Same tiger. Tiger? And why? I like to have fun. You know, I think that you gotta work hard and you, know, you gotta play hard. Absolutely. Okay. Thank it's you. really a bull, but I should have a tiger. Yeah, no, that's actually better. Actually, I, I would be my best friend's dog because he has the best life I've ever seen. <laughs> really, he's like royalty <laughs> in the family. <laughs> But anyway, Mark, first of all, thank you for coming. I really appreciate your time. Um, we just closed the first quarter of 2017. How is the business going this year? Um, it's going really good. Um, the market itself is hot. I mean, anybody in this room that's in real estate can recognize that. I mean, the market's been hot. Um, we had a record, you know, we've had a record breaking month every single month of this year. Um, of month over month, year over year. Uh, we closed right out, I think this shop, 600 transactions so far. Uh, our goal was to close 2,500 units this year. This year? Wow, and um, last year, you did 443 million. And that's under Mark Spano's at your own brokerage. That's, it's pretty insane. Um, was 1,842 transaction. Can you just break it down a little bit, like what you did last year? Because you're, you're independent last year. First year on your own. What did you do? I mean, did you do anything differently? Um, how did you? Was the market really that great, or like? I mean, I, I mean, 
you can't discount the market and, and the economics and the, what's going on in our economy. Um, but what we did differently, I mean, we went, we were already really we were a really big mega company within Keller Williams, so we were already operating pretty independently. Um, <clears throat> The, the difference that we did last year uh, is just really focused on growth, uh, and it's just really about hiring the right people. We're not perfect. Um, any advice that I give to any any person in this room that's running a business or is an entrepreneur, and professions overrated. Uh, is it messy at times? Sure. You know, you see us on a billboard or a TV commercial, or look at our transactions. You can look at and say, "Hey, life looks perfect." Look, I mean, it's not. Right. It's success. I mean. I have a feeling most of the people in this room are entrepreneurs. I mean, success is a little messy. Sometimes it's a lot messy. Um, but you just have to have that grit, that just pedal to the metal. Right? You're going to grow a company. And, and, and know that you're going to make mistakes and you're going to have to pick yourself up and, and keep yourself driven. Absolutely. Um, before we get into, you know, deep into your career and, you know, and, and your, your new venture on um, entrepreneurial estate brokerage, I want to kind of take it back. Back to your roots a little bit, and you. Well, first of all, I'm a big believer in people being a product of their environment, right? Even from a such a young age, people are influenced by their environment. They learn their skills, and that sticks with them throughout their life, maybe forever. Um, can you tell us where you're from? What city did you grow up in, and what you were like as a kid? You know, I was talking to somebody earlier in this room. I mean, I'm a third generation Atlanta, so I think there's only like three or four of us in the entire city. Um, <laughs> I grew up in Snowville, Georgia, um, where everybody's somebody, and went to UGA, uh, graduated from UGA with a management degree. But I, I really grew up in an entrepreneurial family where my dad was, in essence, a serial entrepreneur, and uh, it was my mentor, my hero. Um, I think that I was naive to think that everybody grew up the way I did. And, the older I get, the more blessed I realize I was as a child. And you know it because you learn what you live. And I had great parents who taught me, you know, a good work ethic. You know, uh, created a good foundation for me to, you know, work first, play second. Um, and what really created the drive in me as a as a business person today and an entrepreneur is I come from a sports background. Uh, specifically, I raced bikes early on in my life, BMX bikes, race, BMX bike racer. Um, and then I became a wrestler in high school. And what really drives my success is I just like to win. And I used to I used to really be a little bit shy about that and just not, not quite so outspoken about that, but um, I have an inner, inner drive inside of me that you can't harness, uh, that I just want to win. That's what I, I want to talk to you about that. How, where do you get your drive from? Um, how are you, Consistently hungry, motivated in your craft, day in and out. Well, I think that you have to figure out what your big why is. And so, for years, I would stand up in front of groups like this, and I would say, you know, my big why is my family, and I love my kids. And my wife would always get me in the back room and call BS. Um, <laughs> she knows the truth. She, she, my wife knows me very well. She's my best friend, and she would say, "Honey, I love you, but we'll call BS." <laughs> You would dig ditches and work wherever and deliver pizzas to take care of your family. That's not why you do what you do. So don't tell me you're working late or getting up early for the kids. I, you know. And so as I've gotten into my forties, I really just really tapped into into who I am as a person and realizing that my why is not your why. And it might not be politically correct to everybody in this room or everybody in the world, but it's my why. And I know at the end of the day, I like to win. I'm playing you in tennis, I like to win. You may beat me. And I'm going to be pissed off. <laughs> At me, not you. Um, and once I really got transparent and got the clarity of, of my why and what drives me and why I did well in sports and why I did well in certain things in my life, it's because I really have that drive to win. I'm economically motivated, but that's not my number one thing. Yeah. You know, I just want to win. And that doesn't mean at all costs, because I think there's people who win doing you know, things that are not ethical or lack of integrity. It's winning inside of my head and knowing that I got to do all of it. If you're, we're in the same office and you're beating me, I'm not going to say anything to you. Yeah. I'm going to encourage you, but I'm going to get up earlier than you. I'm going to work later than you. I'm going to read more books than you. I'm going to study more than you. I'm going to hire more coaches than you. 
because that's that's who I am. That's in my DNA. You can't. I try to hire people just like me. Um, it's funny you say that because you know how like some some people they're driven by something that uh, disastrous might have happened to them in their life, right? And they're motivated by that, like a chip on their shoulder. Did you have any kind of event like that, or are you just kind of naturally like um, it, driven? It, it's interesting that you say the chip because. When, I, when I'm interviewing somebody and I'm looking for, there's a couple of things that I'm usually looking for. I'm looking for a high economic job, mm -hmm. means that people who want to make a lot of money. I'm in, commission, I'm in the commission sales business, so obviously this man has to want to make a lot of money. Um, and I'm looking for some kind of, including in leadership, I'm looking for something inside of them <clears throat> that you can't buy, you can't teach, you can't harness. I mean, it's something that, you know, it could be as simple as, Maybe, maybe somebody got pregnant as a junior in college and had to drop out, and they're so mad at the world and mad at themselves because the people around them in their heads think that everybody has a college degree, which really doesn't matter. Right. But they are so driven. They will outwork anybody. They will out, I mean, they are the best of the best. Um, it could be somebody who was a, you know, a captain in the Army. It could be somebody who was a captain of the track team. It, you, you name the things... You know, and, and, and grades, you know, somebody who got straight A's in college is usually not something I'm looking for. That's not, that's not the chip I'm looking for. That's not a track record, in my opinion. I mean, it's, it's a track record that you work hard, but that's not the things that I'm talking about. I'm talking like things that you've got to dig deep in somebody's life story to try to figure it out. Or maybe their dad told them they were never going to be anything. Maybe their dad said, you know what, you're, 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 not gonna, you're never going to succeed. You, you're this, you're that. Or, you know, and maybe so their drive is to try to please that person. So, I mean, that, those things are hard to harness. Um, for me, I just have that in my DNA that I want to freaking win. Absolutely. I, mean, I just, I just, I mean, Joe works with me. He know, I mean, dude, you, you, you challenge me with some number, I'm going to go after it. And I, and I don't think you can teach that, right? You can't it teach just, it. I'm not, I mean, if you know me, I mean, I probably are a little obnoxious and aggressive, but I'm not mean. I mean, I just want to yeah. win. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, if I throw my tennis racket, it's not at you. It's my I can bad because I missed a shot. Just a little frustration. That's all. <laughs> Let's, let's talk about your early days. Um, in 1997, you became a real estate agent. You went to work for REMAX. Um, and and here's, a, here's an interesting fact. You, your team was ranked top 20 almost every year out of 100,000 REMAX agents in more than 75 countries. In 2006, you surpassed the billion dollar mark for lifetime transactions. And it's believed to be you're the re youngest realtor to ever do it within an 11 year time span. What, how does that make you feel? Or what, what did you do when you actually reached that goal? Because that was like from 97 to 98, 99, right? In one decade, you went to a billion in sales. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, 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 it was a great accomplishment. It made me feel good. But I mean, just to, in full transparency, you know, I'll, I'll tell a kind of a funny story. So I was a top two or three Remax guy for 10 years. Um, and then... Again, you, you know my drive now that I like to win. And you would go behind the stage at the end of the year to get the awards. And it's not the trophy, it's just knowing that where, what position you're in. And you could see the position of where your name was on the seats and you would know if you won or not. And every year I kept getting second and third. I'm like, geez, just keep, keep, because they basically quit publishing numbers at about um, beginning of November. So the year that I, finally, my number was not number two or three. I was at, I mean, and, and I saw this other guy's number at number three, and I'm like, all right, I got it. And son of a gun, if a guy didn't beat me from Florida, he, there's a guy in Texas who beat me every year. His name is Joe. Not this Joe, but a different Joe. And so the year that I beat Joe, a guy from Florida beat both of us. <laughs> and so that's what, I mean, that, that, when I was there, I mean, it was just on my bucket list to be number one. I, I never made number one at REMAX. Um, I moved to Keller Williams in May 2011. And my bucket list was to be number one. And so in, in 2012, I was number one from April to November. And by the way, that Joe dude from Remax moved to Keller Williams too. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he's, still, he's still on your list. I'm like, dude, I can't <laughs> freaking get rid of you. <laughs> Katie, Texas, Joe Ralchow, I don't know as well. We're really good friends. And he, so he beat me that year. So... But I was ahead of him from April to November, so I was like, what? Dude, I've, I've got to set my goals so big 
that there's no way he can catch me. So in 2013, that, that year I closed, in 2012, I closed 670 transactions. 2000? 2012. Seven. Okay. 2012, I closed 675 transactions, roughly. So I stood up, in front, and nobody ever that I know of has ever done 1,000 transactions. And so that year I stood in front of my team in January of 2013. I said, hey, we're going to be number one in Keller Williams in the world in transactions and sales volumes and commissions earned. I said, we're going to close 1,000 transactions. They thought I was crazy. They literally, they, they later told a couple of my good friends in, in our organization thought I was crazy. And so basically what, what, so the power of that knowing that setting that goal out front of my team, I met with my team every day at 7.30. We had a daily huddle at 7.30. I mean, I was going to push them as hard as I live and could. How big was your team? How many it was people? probably 25, 30 people back then. And so that year in 2000, I mean, and so just with sheer force and grit and determination, in 2013, we closed 1,412 transactions. Um, we, we blew out everybody in the water. I beat my goal by 40%. And, and I say that because if, you, if, you kinda, if you're looking at the first dominoes, I got really clear on what I wanted. So, so most goals, 50% of all goals are achieved by just writing them down. 80 to 90% when you speak it to a crowd or a group of people. I did all, I did, I did all those things. And because I don't like, remember, I like to win. I don't like to lose. And I just put forth every single thing. And I, I set a goal so big and hairy and audacious that nobody was going to catch me. And that's, but that's who I am. I figured out who I was and what drove me. Um, and my challenge with the people in this room was just to, would be to figure out who you are. Figure out, don't make it my why, make it your why. Figure out what your purpose is. And if you want to do something really big in life and achieve something really big, would be to create a goal so big that your actions take place to help you achieve that goals. Because if you don't have a big goal, your actions are going to be baby. If you have a baby goal, your actions are going to be baby. you got to have your goal so big that you take huge, huge steps and huge actions to achieve it. You know what Ricky Bobby says, right? If, if you're not first, you're last. Uh, we're going to go there? Really? <laughs> I, even, I no. haven't had a beer. You probably had a beer. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just kidding. But, I mean, what you've done, you know, accomplishments, even if you weren't first, I mean, I mean, understand it's a number, right? But accomplishments and what you've done, I mean, that goes a long way. Just, yeah, because that, that, that number one is just a number in my head. Yeah, exactly. I don't care about what everybody else thinks. Right. It's just, that's what drives me. Right. Um, and have you, you've always been in real estate. Have you ever worked in like corporate America, did anything different? This is like your yeah. passion. Like you, you just stepped into it and we're like, hey, I love this. Yeah. I, like I don't look at myself as a, as a real, realtor. I mean, I look at myself as an entrepreneur that just happens to be in the real estate business. I mean, my career path was uh, graduated from college, built about 100 houses. I was a builder right out of college. Uh, my parents were in the real estate business. I went to work for Colony Homes at that time, so I, I was sold on site for a builder. I joined Remax in 97. Um, and then when the market shifted in 2011, or really 2008 through 2010, 11, um, we really got into, you know, we, our, the bulk of the market in Atlanta was short sales and foreclosures and distressed properties, so we got really good at short sales. Um, and then we started working with some hedge funds. Hedge fund, I mean, we, we had the assets that the hedge funds wanted. Um, back when nobody even in real estate knew what a hedge fund was. So um, we got really good at it long before anybody else. It's kind of like what I tell people is the bigger you are and the more you pay attention, the more you see around corners. So I could see that, you know, the, the equity market was changing, like real estate equity sales, like normal traditional sales. So we got into distress early on. Um, and then we got into the hedge fund business. And then... There was a little, I did have a little stint in corporate America where in 2012, when the, the REITs were coming into Atlanta and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the imitation homes and the colony Americans, I became the regional head in Atlanta for imitation homes. So um, I started imitation homes in Atlanta, you know, as far as hiring all the people, we bought all their assets. I left my team for about a year um, and, and, and bought the assets for them in Atlanta, built out their infrastructure, their office. And then I just realized that I'm an entrepreneur. I'm not, I'm, not a, I'm not a private equity guy that's going to sit behind some spreadsheets and a computer. Yeah. That's just not who I am. Um, and, and, and I 
I wanted the job so bad because it was a challenge to get it. Uh, and I love the guys, and they're all still, I'm really close to all of them. But I just, uh, I ended up leaving them in about October 2012 to kind of go back into my company. Um, and just realizing that I'm an entrepreneur at heart. It's not about the money. It's about doing my own thing and being, being me uh, and just building a big company. And really just, my goal is to change the face of real estate long term. You didn't enjoy sitting in a queue. Nor I, I don't like conference calls either. Yeah. On Sunday afternoons at about 1 o'clock when it's your wife's birthday, that's not very fun. They're great people, but I'd call my friend at private equity who was in private equity. I'm like, dude, is this, the, is this normal? Yeah. Like every weekend we got to have a conference call? It's structured. Structured <laughs> it's environments. Very, it's their money. They have a right. I mean, dude, we were, we were buying, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of homes. So I, I was held highly accountable to them. And we did a good job. It just wasn't my world. So I came back um, to my company in 2012. So, so that period at Blackstone really changed my life because that was, a, that was a pivotal moment where I was really surrounded, kind of like you talk about environment. I was surrounded by, you know, the billionaires of the world who were the largest private equity firm in the world. And I watched how they th how they th how their brains think, how they, how they do things, what actions they would take. And, and guys who make a lot of money, and, and they are big macro thinkers. They do not get caught in the weeds. Um, so that period, that, that year period with them shaped my, shaped my life because it was either going to go private equity world and just run it all the way to the top there or stay in my company and really build something amazing. And so in 2012, like I said, we probably had 25, maybe max 30 people and did about 600 transactions. So fast forward four years later, we tripled the size of our company. We have about 110 people that work for us. Um, we, we, just launched our, you know, we're, we just launched our third office. We're in the process of launching our fourth office in Marietta. We just opened Stockbridge this week. Um, and we're growing very fast. Um, and it's awesome. But I had a decision to make. I mean, I, could, mm -hmm. I wasn't going to stay flat and, and, and <clears throat> in my world boring. I, I really needed to do something big. If I was going to come back to my team, I was going to do something big because I'd been around all these guys that were doing huge, huge things and changing the face of real estate. Well, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do the same thing. Absolutely. Um, so you've been in the real estate business for 20 plus years, right? And any time during the, that time frame, did you ever feel like giving up? Did you have like, I mean, I know 2008 was a rough period for a lot of real estate professionals, um, but... Did you ever feel like, hey, you know what, I'm, I'm done with this, you know, things aren't going right, um, your down periods, dark days, you know, challenges that you ever encountered throughout your career? Yeah, I, I, I never, I never, it was never a moment that I was ever going to quit because I'm not a quitter. Mm -hmm. um, my dad would kill me if I was a quitter. <laughs> right, kick my tail. So, um, no, I'm not a quitter. But, but, I mean, there were some dark times. I mean, there were, there were periods where... Um, in 2008, I mean, I can remember, I got, I got married in 2008 in September, and I remember from September, September 2008 to, like, January, February 2009, I'm like, all of a sudden, you know, when, when things are flush, if anybody was in this real estate business from 2000 to 2007, dude, you were flush, and you, you didn't have to try that hard to be it was flush. It pretty bad. Oh. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, the money in your bank account is going like this. And so that's why we got into short sales and got really good at short sales because it was either survive, you know, or die. Um, and so as a product of short sales, they take a long time to close. So we had probably 250 listings, about another 200 pendings. Um, in 2011, we were with the largest REMAX organization in the country, REMAX of Greater Atlanta, and they filed bankruptcy on us. And if you know anything about bankruptcy, it wasn't me filing bankruptcy. I just happened to be an independent contractor who had, happened to be the whale in this company. Um, they bounced. I can remember. I mean, they just, I, 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 remember, I knew they had some struggles, and I told my wife, I said, honey, here's like $130,000 worth of commission checks. Go down to Citizens Bank and hammer the checks. So if anybody grew up in construction or anything like that, hammer the checks means go get a certified funds. We need to make sure this money's real. And $130,000 was ton of money to us back then and she went to the bank and she thought she was doing the right thing she went to the bank and they said well we can um, you'd have to drive downtown but what we can do is we can reserve the funds for you she thought she had it all covered but when you reserve the funds and they file bankruptcy they basically take those funds right back 
So all that money bounced. So basically, the first, the first sign of it, they bounced $130,000 worth of checks to us. And my agent's checks were bouncing from the, from the real estate company, from Remax as well. So we were like, whoa, what do we do? And by the way, we had 450 listings, 200 and something pending and 200 listings. Um, I'd hire, hire a couple of law firms to protect me. We went through this bankruptcy court and realized that they were more powerful than the IRS. They rejected my independent contractor agreement. They used me as the test case where basically I was paying the law firm to basically write the test case for the entire organization because there were 650 agents. I was paying the law firm that represented me to basically create the settlement to the first lender or the first lien holder. So I ended up losing about half a million bucks. You got to remember, like we weren't back in, if you remember back in 2011, we weren't selling a lot of real estate. Yeah. I think I was going to the gym about three hours a day. I was running. I was <laughs> that was a recovery so was period. Like, oh, yeah. <laughs> so just trying to survive. Um, and so it was, it, I mean, it, it was, it was tough, but, but our goal was to keep our team in place, to keep all our people whole. Um, so I had to stay back at Remax for a period of about five, six months to close out the transactions because you can't abandon your listings. I actually activated my dad's real estate license, put him at Keller Williams. So, because again, we're listing, you, you're keeping, you keep bringing in new business into a toxic asset, which is Remax, Greater Atlanta at that time. And so I got my dad in place, moved everybody over, the team over to Keller. They kept listing houses under the Spain team. I'm over here at Mark Spain team. We're, I'm trying to work through this bankruptcy thing. Um, and so I finally settled at like, you know, 50 cents on the dollar for all the commissions they owe me. Um, and we just, we just worked our way out. Uh, we made all our agents whole. We didn't take any money from our agents. And we just fought through it. I mean, we just, we just sucked it up and fought like hell and, and, and put, you know, got, got back up on our feet, became very, very good at short sales. I mean, to the point where it's one of those things that when you, when you just keep fighting and you keep doing what you need to do, and, you know, and keep creating movement, things happen. I mean, then all of a sudden, banks started calling me and, and builders started calling me saying, hey, I, I, all our assets are in distress. Can you, you, we can't sell our own assets, but you, we, the bank wants you to take over all of them. So then all things started, good things started happening. And because of that situation, it had, I was comfortable at Remax. Had that not happened to me moving over to Keller, who put me into a one-on-one -on -one type mentorship with Gary Keller, uh, which, which changed my life. And, and, and really the point of this whole story is sometimes through adversity comes opportunity. And like I told you before, success can be very messy and it might look really pretty on a TV commercial with Barbara Corcoran. Well, there's a lot of messy stuff behind that. And, you know, I got into a relationship with Gary Keller, who, you know, the founder of Keller Williams. Um, and, he, and that man just challenged me to think so much bigger than I've ever thought in my life. Um, he's like, man, you're, 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 you're doing awesome and your numbers look good, but you're like, you're just thinking so small. And he just kept pushing me and pushing me to think bigger and expand the way my mind was, you know, my mind was thinking. And that changed my life. And being in that relationship, and, and, and the point is here is relationships matter and who you hang around with matters. And if you don't have a good coach or a good mentor, I mean, that, that's your first step. Um, and he just taught me how to think bigger, how to, you know, he, you know it was kind of like getting an MBA in entrepreneurship with him. I mean, that's really cool because Gary Keller, he's a founder of Keller Williams. Mm -hmm. how, how did that even come about? that he was going to mentor you? Well, there's a guy, Sean Rawls, in Atlanta. So when, I'm, when I was thinking, of, when, when I was in the, in, in the mess with Remax, Sean Rawls, um, who, who owns a lot of the Keller Williams offices in Atlanta, we were both at Remax together at the time. He made a phone call to Gary and said, hey, I got my friend, he's in trouble with Remax. Can you, can, you, can, you, can you call him up and help him out? This is before I joined Keller. And so I can remember, I'm, at De I'm in Destin, Florida. I get a call from this guy and I answered and we talked for a little while and he kind of gives me some advice. And he says, um, call me anytime. You know, at Remax, I couldn't get to anybody. Yeah. I, I mean, nobody would help me. I mean, they couldn't. I mean, they were tied up in franchise agreements. They had to kind of have a hands-off approach, kind of let the, the market take its course. And so this guy, Gary, who I don't even know, says, hey, you know, call me if you need anything. I said, oh, okay, is this your cell number? He's like, no, it's my home number. <laughs> if you need my cell, I'll give it to you. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, this is like some billionaire dude. Like, I'm like, this doesn't happen, you know. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he was nice about that. Oh, like, gosh. He's just so graceful and humble. And he's just that kind of a humble leader that just taught me a lot about, he taught me a lot about giving. He taught me a lot about, you know, living well below my means and investing in my business, you know. Um, 
don't spend everything you make. He just taught me a lot of things about life and uh, it changed the trajectory of my success. I mean, if you look at the time when I joined Keller Williams, that Remax, I was pretty flat. I was top two or three, whatever. No matter how hard I worked, the dial wasn't changing more than 5%. So it's kind of like, yeah. What Keller, he taught me a lot about just life and how to be a better person, but what he really taught me is how to leverage people. And one of the best pieces of advice he ever gave me was, when you're an un unhappy in any area of your life, you're missing a person. That's probably be the best piece of advice I can give you this entire time you're here. If you're, missing, if, if, you, if you're unhappy in any area of your life, you're missing a person. If you're unhappy in your marriage, you're missing a marriage counselor. If you're unhappy in your spirituality, in your faith, you're missing a minister. Finance, financial coach. Business, business coach, mentor. Health, nutrition, I mean, you name it, and if you, if you sit down over the next week and think about what I'm saying, it'll hit home to you. So when you're in sales, and all of a sudden your sales team hits a brick wall, or me as, as an entrepreneur and a sales guy, I hit a brick wall in production, and everybody has a natural ceiling. You can only get so far, and everybody's natural ceiling is different. Mine might be 150 transactions, yours might be 110, yours may be 200. But when you hit that natural, trans I mean, natural ceiling of ability, or natural wall, the only way to keep growing that natural ceiling is to hire a new person. Replace yourself. Get leverage. And most people, and most, a lot of entrepreneurs, if you ever see a company go on a fast track and then all of a sudden stall out, they quit hiring people. They become the smartest person in the room, which, which is an entrepreneur and a leader. You want to be the quietest, dumbest guy in the room. You want to hire people a lot smarter than yourself. And I'll tell you, that's what he taught me, and that's what's changed our company is, I mean, I have people on my team and in, in leadership and in sales that are, they are savants. They are so much smarter than me. They are awesome. Um, and where I really got focused and what he got me focused on was spend 80% of my time on finding people, looking for people, looking for Michael Jordan or, or, or you know, LeBron James before they become LeBron James. Was last year your record-breaking year with, like, yeah. closed transactions? I mean, every year for the last probably four years have been like that. And you just kept, kept breaking? Kept on, and, and, and if you look at my pattern, it's people, 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 leads, people, people, leads, people, people. And, and you're not involved in these transactions. You're running the business, right? Right. We're, we're, we're running a corporate level sales team. So that's, that's what I want to talk to you about. You're not involved in day-to-day -day transactions. Your employees are out there listing, closing deals. So what are you doing to coach them, to mentor them? What is the process like? Or how, do you, how are you getting the best out of your employees to go out there and just kill it? Well, again, it kind of goes back to what my mentor taught me. He goes, can you motivate people? Well, I mean, I guess you can a little bit. I mean, you got a gun, you got, you know. <laughs> um, you hire motivated people. And my goal is not to motivate them. My goal is to coach, train, lead, clear the decks, do the messy stuff that people don't want to do. It's, it's if, if, if you want to make a million dollars and I set up a compensation plan that gets to you to a million dollars, I'm not going to motivate you to get to a million dollars if that's not what you, if you want to make 250 and I want you to make a million, there's no way that delta is going to correct itself because I'm pushing you. I can get you 10% more, but what you want to do is hire people who want to make a million dollars, create a pathway for them to make a million dollars or whatever that number is and then get things out of their way and get, get, make, keep things simple. You know, what we do is we try to complicate things so much that the people, the people who want to succeed can't. So you're hiring new people, right? But are you hiring brand new agents fresh out of, like, getting their real estate license? Or are you hiring seasoned, or at least two or I'd three say, years? I'd say we hire a mix. I mean, we do hire a tremendous amount of people right out of college. I mean, we, we you know, um, we have a very loyal following from UGA yeah. and Alabama and all, I mean, a lot of different schools that... Um, I mean, a ton, I mean, we have a great relationship with UGA. They send, we send, we, they send us a lot of people to come to work for us. And we train them. We have a director of training that, I mean, when people leave our organization, they're highly, I mean, when they, they leave training, they are ready to roll. I mean, they've been through all the testing. They've shadowed 25 listing appointments. They've done all things that it might take a normal agent five to seven years to actually go through that type of training because we give you real world experience. Okay. Well, Mark, let's talk about the grind. Um, this is what the show is all about, right? Everybody has ideas, but if you're not putting in the work and executing it, it's useless, right? Um, can you give us a glimpse into your daily grind? Like, and break it down into two parts. One, when you actually first started, like, what was your day like? Because you know, you're just learning the business as well. 
uh, and trying to scale up. And now, as, as you own Mark Spain Real Estate, what is your daily grind? Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's interesting because I probably work less now at, you know, say 2,000 transactions than I did at 75 transactions. Actually, that, that's a true statement for no, no question. <clears throat> I mean, I work a lot because I love to work and I love what I do and I love the people that work for me. Um, but, I mean, it, it's... Back in the day, when I was young and dumb and just didn't really, just didn't really know a lot, and you're just trying to, just, you're, you're basically trying to muscle your way through everything. And um, I have a great work ethic, so if you get, like I said, if you get up at 7 o'clock, I'm going to get up at 5. If you get up at 5, I'm going to get up at 3. So back in the day, I just worked like, like I mean, like it's on a hamster wheel. I mean, I just worked and worked and worked and worked, and I did well. I mean, you know, I, as, a, as a, but that's not sustainable and that's not a quality of life. You know, um, I'm out every night on listing appointments. I'm getting home at 10, 10, 30. My meal's in the microwave every night. You know, uh, my kids are sleeping. I, don't, I miss all the sporting events. And it's just, it's, it's because what, what was missing back in the day, plus you're building a business. So, I mean, there's, I don't want to say, there, there's no such thing as a balanced life. Right. You balance, I mean, you work your butt off, and then you counterbalance. You get out of balance, and then you counterbalance. You get out of balance. So, so back in the day, I would work, you know, 70, 80, 90 days straight, and I'd take a long weekend. Recharge. 70, 80, 90 days straight, take a long weekend. Um, but as I've gotten older and gotten smarter and hung around smarter people, I've learned a lot about leverage. And so I don't need to manage 150 people, 120 people. What I need is, you know, three to five savans, three to five young Michael Jordans that are just amazing, and that's who I, that's who I lead. And if I lead them and help, help them, they lead, they lead, they lead, they lead. Um, and there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one time, there's a lot of coaching, there's a lot of mentoring, and we're all really close. Um, and, and you got to love on your people, man. I mean, our organization, although albeit perfect, I mean, we, we have a cool culture. I mean, if you, if you look online and look at our company, I mean, the company culture is pretty dang amazing. Uh, and, and you're going to spend a, the bulk of your time with your people you work with. You might as well have, have nice people and love your people and have fun with them. Absolutely. A good working environment is definitely needed for success. Um, this part of the, uh, the show, I want, you know, I'm going to ask you a few questions. We just want to get to know you on a more personal level. Sure. So just answer it with whatever comes to your mind first. Um, name one song that motivates you and makes you feel like you can do anything. Thunderstruck. Who's that by? ACDC. Okay. My favorite band. All right. Plays at every sales meeting. <laughs> every sales meeting, ACDC. Every morning? Every, 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 on the Wednesdays, man. That's the, that's the music on the system. Name three people that inspire you. Um, Warren Buffett, Michael Jordan, Gary Keller. What is the last book you read? Leaders Eat Last. Is there a book that, um, that had a big impact on your career or you know, a favorite book? Yeah, I mean, I think that my, my dad got me to, I mean, there's a, there's a couple. Um, the Psychology of Winning by Dr. Dennis Waitley back when I was probably 14 years old. Um, it's a book that I pay my kids to read. Um, <laughs> you, you, got, you gotta pay your kids. It's, it's, it's not my idea. Um, actually, so I have, a, so I have, a, I have an 18-year-old daughter, so, and, I, and I learned this from Andy Stanley, and I learned it from Dave Ramsey, is, is, and really Gary Keller, too, is, is there's $10 books, and there's $50 books, and there's $100 books, and you, you have different books. I mean, like, How to Win Friends and Influence People. I mean, that's one of my daughter's books that she had to read. I mean, it's like a $50 book. But that's, that's life-changing. And so if I can get her to read those things, and it changes her mindset. Absolutely. Um, and our, our company, I mean, we're big readers. You know, um, one of my favorite books... Um, it's actually, this is actually the last book I read, and I've read it for the second time. It's called Relentless. Um, Tim Grover? Tim Grover. He was the, Michael Jordan's personal trainer. Yeah. Um, unbelievable book. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm rereading it the second time right now. It's, it's very, very powerful. I just recommended that book to my friend. I, um, I'm going gonna, gonna to get on that next week, actually. Um, what's your favorite restaurant? Uh, sushi Nami. Pretty good. Um, Pretty good. It's, it's actually pretty they good. They fly their fish in. <laughs> What's your Ru second favorite restaurant? It's not Ru Sons. It's What's that? Your second favorite restaurant? Uh, it used to be Dante's Down the Hatch. They closed the daggum thing. That was really cool. Um, I like Marcel's. Okay. 
Would you rather be a ghost or an alien? And why? We didn't rehearse these questions. <laughs> uh, I'd probably, I guess, a ghost. I have no idea why. Just go around the office scaring people. An alien seems kind of scary. I don't know, a ghost maybe. Well, at least, I mean, you, you have a cool transportation, right? Yeah, man. You fly around. Float around and spy on people. Um, what would you say your greatest accomplishment is or achievement? I think just raising daughters. I mean, that's, you know. Great. I, I got a, you know, my 18 year old daughter to graduate from high school. She's a great kid. I mean, I think that's a, being a parent of a teenager is probably one of the hardest things you ever do in your life. And it's the most rewarding. It's just, you know, um, having that really tight relationship with my daughters is very, Absolutely. it's key. What's the hardest part of being an entrepreneur? <clears throat> Time management. In your life so far, what year did you work the hardest and why? Uh, 2012, um, that's when I went to work for a private equity firm. Blackstone, I mean, they did. I thought I worked a lot in real estate, man. I, I, that, that, that year I probably worked 100 hours a week. Uh, I couldn't work anymore. Wow. They were on the West was, Coast. I'd set that my was like four up. years ago. Yeah, it was crazy. Man. Yeah. Crazy. Um, and, in a good way. I mean, that's taught me a lot. Absolutely. If you, if you weren't in real estate, what else would you be doing? Um, I'd be an entrepreneur. I mean, I, I'm sure that I, I, mean, I have a love for, like, plants and landscapes. I mean, I'd probably, like, have some type of massive frickin' tree farm or something somewhere. <laughs> you didn't expect that, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> you, you garden? Or you like gardening? You know, I, I don't. I don't garden today, but I, lo I love landscapes, and it's my love of landscapes and subdivisions and streetscapes has really got what, what, what got me into real estate and loving real estate. I used to drive neighborhoods as a kid. I just that love. should be a little spinoff of Mark Spain real estate landscaping business. <laughs> Call me, I'll help you with that. Yeah. Um, what is the best thing you like about real estate? Um, I think helping people. I mean, I think that. My dad, I mean, I, I learned this, I mean, my, my dad taught me early on is basically take the commissions out of the transaction and just think about helping people. And the more people you help the, the, and having that servant's heart, I mean, the bigger your success will be. And just always doing the right thing, the commissions come. Don't ever count your commissions. Just always know and do the right thing. You might not, you, you might be, not be perfect, but always make things right. Absolutely. Um, this is what I call the golden nugget. <laughs> You have over 20 years of experience as an entrepreneur, businessman. Uh, you're a real estate connoisseur. You've learned a lot. You know, successes, challenges, failures, ups and downs, good times, bad. Um, what is your greatest piece of advice you can give to aspiring entrepreneurs out there? You know, it's, you got to get out of your comfort zone. It's, it's where the magic happens. Um, and we all tend to just kind of be guarded in our comfort zone. You got to take calculated risk. Um, you, you gotta be. A, you have to be a student. You, you have to, you know. Another recent book that I read recently was Nike Shoe Dog. And if you watch the the story of Phil Knight and the transformation of his <clears> life and all the heck he went through in his life, I mean, we have it pretty cushy. Um, immerse yourself in education and people and study biographies, study successful people, study Sam Walton, study all those people, um, and then surround yourself around successful people. Surround yourself around people that are doing more than you or that strive and have the same like-minded, you know, success. Because if you hire somebody that's, you know, wants to work every day from eight to three, which is nothing wrong with that, but you're trying to be an entrepreneur and grow this thing and be out of balance. You're, you and your friend or you and your, you're going to, you're going to be like this. Um, be willing to get out of balance, especially when you're starting things and know you can counterbalance. Um, and, and, and the best advice I can give you is it's not going to be perfect. Success is messy as hell. It's, it's sloppy, it, there's periods where it's just real ugly. But have that fortitude and that grit and that, 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 that power to just push through that ambition to get yourself to the other side. And then you'll go through another iteration of, of messiness as you go up. It's never going to be like this. It's like, it's a zigzag. I have, this is the last question tonight for me. And then we, you know, we'll get into Q&A and, a and have, give everybody else a chance to ask a question. Um, what type of legacy do you want to leave behind and how do you want people to remember you as? Um, I think for, for, for me is just having a legacy that I changed the world of real estate and, and things that are, you know, that we do things different than the traditional real estate company. Um, and know that we gave back to the community, that we weren't just takers. Um, 
it's great to be successful, but you got you to you pause and get back. You, you, you we're all in this fight together and know that we may be more fortunate than other people and, and other, everybody goes through unfortunate times and just be willing to, you know, to bend down and help people out. Absolutely. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Man. Really Thank appreciate you. that. Um, and, and Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so we're, we're going to get into Q&A, so um, who asked questions? All right, um, we're going to get you a microphone real quick. Hey, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Mark, for doing what you're doing. Uh, with rising interest rates a little bit, where do you see the housing market and the purchase market? Uh, are you worried about anything with interest rates? With, I, I, I'm in the mortgage business. I work for Equity Prime. Okay. And uh, I still think rates are still low, even if they hit 4.5%, whatever the heck it is. Yeah, I think they what, were. What do you see? Yeah, I think that, I mean, we've been at free money for five years, um, essentially. And I know when I started in the business, rates were like nine and a half percent, you know. Um, it's when the two one buy down was very sexy. Um, <clears throat> most people probably don't even know what that is. But I, I think as long as we stay below six, six and a half percent, I think we're gonna be fine. You know, will it squeeze, you know, five percent, seven percent out of the market? Yeah. I mean, I don't see people today in our world maxing out everything they're doing just because rates are fairly, you know, fairly low today still. Um, actually, sometimes when rates go up, which we've seen, I think that you see that some of that robustness in the market as people get off the fence because they get they realize that the bottom is bounced, and finally, you know, things get moving. So, in the '90s, weren't like rates like 18 percent crazy? It was in the '80s or '80s. Jimmy, yeah, like yeah, seven, '70s, early '80s, like the Jimmy Carter era. I mean, I, I it was beyond my day, but I mean, the highest I've ever experienced like nine and a half percent, which is like the first Gulf War. <coughs> Person in the back. Oh, sorry. So you you mentioned uh, a lot of your mentors helped you look at the macro, look at what's around the corner. What do you think's around the corner now? Uh, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. So for, so yeah, what I was saying is, if you pay attention, you can see around corners. And so if you look at the iterations of my success or my my business, I mean, we were heavy into the builder world. As that market shifted, we were, it became heavy, heavy in traditional sales. When you know, the market shifted into short sales, you know, I mean, when the distressed properties and the economy was going down, we shifted our business into short sales. And then because we had so much short sale inventory, we attracted the investors. We started working with a lot of investors, and then we realized equity's coming back because every time we're making offers on the properties, we're having five and six offers, <coughs> so we knew equity's coming back. So we shifted our marketing to traditional sales. Um, I mean, right now, I think that traditional sales, I mean, you're, we're going to be, I mean, there's a shortage of inventory. I think that as builders retool right now, and, and if you, you hear a lot, of that, a lot of talk with builders retooling to basically build a slimmer, trimmed down version of their product so they can sell $250,000, $300,000 houses, um, that price point is disappearing very fast. So entry level housing, you know, is, is, is hot if you can find lots and you can find the municipalities that will allow you to build it. Um, but I think that we have a good two, I, as far as I can see, it's about two years of traditional sales, just gangbusters, especially in the right school district pockets. Hi, Mark. I'm Hi. Stephanie. I'm a Keller Williams agent. And my question is, what was your all-in moment in business? Have you taken a risk so big that you were literally all in? God, I tell my coach all the time I hate being all in. Um, you know, I, I think I'm more probably like a calculated risk guy. Like I, I, I never want to be all in. Um, but... I mean, through 08, through 012, I mean, I was all in. It was, it was just survive and do all you can to make it to the other side. You knew it would come back at some point. We, nobody realized that the correction would be that deep and that hard and that that many good people would be taken out, that many smart business people would be taken out. Um, it's just fighting through that time. Um, and honestly, you didn't really have time to think about it because it was just survive. Keep your team in place because once you get to the other side, if your team's still together, you're going to be in really good shape. We got a couple of them here. Hi, Mark. Hi. Um, so um, the real estate industry is a very, very referral-based industry. When you're looking to partner with someone uh, with your business that you've built up with and taken so much time to build, what are you looking for to trust someone with your business? 
or yeah, to so, just partner with you? Yeah, so it's, um, I think we're looking for people with, who care about people, who, like I said, aren't worried about the commission checks, who aren't worried about their, their fees, and, and they know that, I mean, a true partner is a true partner, so we're all in it together. You know, it can't be, you know, we are going to go in this fight together. It can't be all me and then you, you, you win, or it, can't, it has to be a win-win type of scenario. And then a lot of our partners, we're in the retail business. And so I look for partners who answer their phone, who return calls fast, who answer emails fast, who, if I need them at 2 o'clock on a Saturday, answer their phone or get back to me very quickly. Because let's just forget, let's just, we'll talk about a mortgage lender for a second. So let's just say that you're my lender. And you, you want to work eight to five Monday through Friday, you can't be my lender because our, that's when we're doing paperwork. <laughs> the retail buyers and sellers get home from work about six and we work six to 10 with our retail buyers and sellers and then we work Saturdays and Sundays because that's when we're showing property. If you can't take a loan app at 3.30 in the afternoon on a Friday, then why are you, why are you a loan officer? And so I'm working, we're partners. Yeah. You, you know, can you take time off? That's not what I mean. Get an assistant. Just, we're grinding it together. Yeah. Thank you. And, and if you don't return calls until Monday morning, then do you never, you'll never make it. Thank you. Hey, Mark. Hi. My name's Tammy, and um, I'm also with Keller Williams. And my question to you is, what is your advice for new agents competing for a listing with seasoned top producing agents? Um, hopefully you're not competing with me. <laughs> I like to win. Um, They're coming for you. I think that there's always a way to compete with everything. I think that you have to build, you have to find my weaknesses and I have to find your weaknesses. So you, and then I think you have to build, you have to build a resume that makes sense. So you may have to build a resume or a marketing book that talks more about Keller Williams than your, if you're brand new, you don't have any track records, but you could say, hey, my office has sold 120 houses in your zip code in the last quarter. Or we, we have sold 120 houses in your zip code. We have done this. We have done that. We have done, you know. That, that's the way I would approach it. And, and this can, uh, you know, client concierge type service. Uh, I'm, I'm a boutique agent. I'm not this, you're not going to be a number with me. Does that make sense? And just find, find people like my, I mean, we, I have weaknesses. If you're competing with me, you can find them. I'm not telling you. <laughs> I like to That's win. That's the secret sauce right there. I like to win. Uh, Mark, uh, goals are important, but you have to take steps. So what are the five things, you, what steps you took which made what you are? Like you are going to spend 200000 in marketing. You're going to start using a CRM. What are five things you did which made you what you are today? Um, I, mean, I could have done two, three, but... You wanted me to, I can't remember past, I, I'm a sales guy, I can't remember past three. Um, yeah, I mean, you don't wake up one day and say, I want to spend $2 million in advertising. I mean, you, you build into that. I mean, it's, you know, um, again, it goes back, I'll just kind of tell you, I mean, like quick slices of my success is I had great parents. That, that set my foundation of work ethic. You work first, you play second. That's the way my parents taught me. My dad you know, was my mentor and pushed me in sports. He, 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 I was the son that could, could be pushed, and when you pushed me, I excelled. You pushed me, I excelled, because, you know, I just was competitive. So being in, involved in a sports-type environment that was very structured in, in a competitive way, that shaped me. My dad was a serial entrepreneur, so I read, I can remember as a kid, I would get his success magazines, and I'd read them. I'd take the Atlanta Business Chronicle from my mom, and I'd read them. Um, my dad just started getting me to read books like Anthony Robbins, Unlimited Power and Waking the Giant, and those kinds of things as a teenager, which I thought was normal, but I look back now, it's probably pretty weird. <laughs> um, and, you know, I had a landscaping company when I was 16 years old because I love landscaping, and, 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 and I just was an entrepreneur, and I watched my parents. Um, but as, I, as, as my life has evolved, it's just, it really has come down to, it's the books you read and the people you hang around with. And you want to, you know, most CEO of, you know, Fortune 100 companies, they read like 30 to 50 books a year. And so if you, can't, if you don't want to read, I mean, use audible.com and pick one way to work. Pick one way to work or one way from home. I used to tell everybody, every time you're in your car, listen to the podcast, do this. I mean, that's a little extreme. So just pick one way. I've learned to pull it back a little bit. Just one way and just marinate your mind and you'll begin to, what you put in your mind 
you'll get double or triple or quadruple the output. Um, and then become a student. I study, and I, I don't usually have all the ideas. I've usually just, you know, just studied other people and other businesses and, and, and mimicked them and made them better. Um, I'm always learning and listening and looking and trying to be better. And, and, and pick good partners who teach you. You know, like we have a couple of partners in, in the room right here today that are some of our partners, and they teach us a lot of stuff. Because if I'm like the guy who knows everything, and I'm popping my mouth off all the time, then people aren't going to talk to me. They're not going to want to help me because I'm arrogant, and I, I, don't, I don't want to be that guy. You know, you have to learn to duct tape my mouth, sit on my hands. That's good information, though. Mark. That was more than five, but I wanted you to kind of understand. I didn't, it wasn't like a perfect sequence, but... Mark, when did you know to move out of the sales role into the leadership role, and how did you do that? Um, so this is interesting. So this is my, my, me and my dad had a difference of opinion here, and he kept saying, every time you send a listing agent to an appointment, you got to call the seller, and you got to do this, and you got to get them home. And I was like, I'm not doing that. This is where we bought different generations, because he was old school. And um, I think that just when I, when I realized that my wife was eight months pregnant, I was out on listing appointments every single night till like 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, my wife's going to have a baby while I'm at a listing appointment in Alpharetta. And I realized I, did, I had to like, just, I had to do something different. I was just burning, burning on all ends and all spectrums. And I just, I just said, hey, I got, I got to hire a listing agent. I got, I got to just start pulling back. And I, I didn't follow the perfect model. I mean, I just, it was more out of necessity because, I mean, literally, I mean, my wife was going to have a baby and I was going to be listing a house. Um, and so... And then when I got leverage, I realized how much faster it could go. And then I read a great book called The E-Myth by Michael Gerber, and it you know, taught me how to work on my business, work harder on my business than in my business. And I'm like, that's when my world began to change, as I really began to systemize the company and make it at, you know, a, a really cool place. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, hi. I have been with Keller Williams for the last six months. Uh, I was sponsored by Sean Rawls, your friend. And one thing I learned from him is, uh, in real estate, there is not a bad market or a good market, he told me. Probably you heard about it too. It's always a buyer's market or a seller's market. It is how you build your relationships, it works. And what I'm hearing from you right now is basically what I've heard at Keller Williams in the classes. It's exactly, I think, just wanted to ask you, how much Gary Keller played a role in your life? to move you from that level of stagnation to the level you are in? Oh, a tremendous amount. If you look at my, if you, if you look on a statistical chart or like a sales chart and you watch my success, it went like this and it flattened out for about 10 years. So from about, I mean, give or take here, but from 2000 to 2011, it was pretty flat. I was a top three producer in the country for a you know, top, com top company in the world, but I was bored and I was flattened out. And I mean, he had a, I mean, he was an impetus part of my career shift in my whole way I would think. You know, I mean, I, and I, I talk about him a lot. I mean, he's, it, it made a huge difference. So if you, can, if you can land yourself in that type of relationship with somebody or hire a coach like that, I mean, your world will change. I mean, because my company from 2011 to 2017 will have almost went up 500%. I mean, when you're already that big, that's, that's, a, that's a big, I mean, a five... Oh, no. <clears throat> oh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, opened, it expanded the way I was thinking. I mean, I gamify everything. If you'll learn, if you hang around me, you'll learn I gamify everything in my head as a game to myself, not to the world. And the number one is just a chase. It's a mechanism that I chase. Um, but it, it, he helped shift the way I thought. I mean, I was thinking too little. I was thinking too micro. I needed to get, like, on the big picture. Instead of one office in Atlanta, I need to think about seven. Instead of 1,000 transactions in one office, I needed to think about 25,000 transactions in four or five states. And that's just a way, you, it's, 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 it's just different. It's just thinking, you're right, it's in your mind. Hi, Mark. Um, Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, I know you're a numbers guy, but I was trying to figure out, um, are you, how granular are you with your marketing and your numbers and your data? Have you gotten to a point where you're hiring data scientists and really crunching those numbers and look at all your marketing channels because we have the commercials, we have the billboards, the online marketing that's trying to figure out um, what are you doing as far as like um, just crunching all that data? Yeah, so, I mean, I'm not quite a full big picture guy. I mean, I'm actually, 
I have that analytical side of my brain and spreadsheets and numbers and data and Salesforce and all that stuff. So, but what I have it is I've, it's systemized. So every, so for instance, and I'm a marketing guy. I mean, my business is really heavily built on marketing. So, I mean, every night at 8.30, my Salesforce reports start getting sh shot to me in email. So every night I'm looking at every single lead, where it came from, not because I have to, or, I mean, Joe is my marketing guy, really. But he knows I like to, I mean, I just like to know where my business is at every single day because I love what I do and I love the numbers. Um, because really, you could break down business as an accounting equation. It's just math. Um, and where your largest expense is, it's one of our largest expense outside of payroll is marketing and advertising, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to it. I'm going to know, every, I, I can tell you every single lead source and tell you where it's working, what's not. Uh, are there guys like me that probably aren't that granular? Probably, but that's what I love. I mean, I'm a, in the heart of hearts, I'm a marketing guy. I love advertising. I love marketing. I love, you know, J Joe's a, Joe's a, Joe came from a digital agency, a marketing guy. And I've come from the terrestrial side, billboards, radio, TV. And so our marriage has been amazing because it's the blend of the two worlds. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a data junkie. But I don't, need to put, I don't need to be putting the data in. I just want to look at it. Make sense? Yes. Um, my name's Stephanie, and um, when you say that you work harder than everybody else, what activities are you doing? What are your lead gen for like the first five years? What were your main lead gen activities that you were focused on? And then uh, I have another question too. Sure, that's fine. You can fight. <laughs> I'll stay as long as you want to stay. Um, I mean, the best advice. I, I mean, again, I don't think I did it the right way. You know. Um, Early on, I had relationships with builders. Builders would refer me business, and you know, um, and then I became a really big postcard advertiser. I, I was a big postcard farmer. I mean, I started out mailing thousand postcards, two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, seven thousand, ten thousand, twenty thousand. Then I realized billboards, TV, radio. Um, if I was advising a new agent, if you said, "Hey, I just got my license, and I don't know what I should do for the next one to five years. What should I do?" I'd say, "Okay." You take the Millionaire Real Estate Agent book, you read it three to five times the first year, and do the same thing the second year. You read the book, The One Thing, which is going to teach you about time management. You get a phone, and every single, and you, and you buy a, some kind of dial or some kind of way to know the neighborhoods you want to work, and you need to call those neighborhoods, and you need to be on the phones every day from 7.30 to 11.30 every single day, five days a week, and I want you pounding the phones and just and working the business through lead generation on the phone. Spend four hours a day lead generating. Expire, expired, expired, FISBOs, FISBOs or circle, circle prospecting. prospecting. I think circle prospecting is probably just as easy, if not easier, than expires because if expires, eight thousand people are calling expired listings. So if you're calling circle prospecting, you know, hey, I have a buyer looking for homes in your area. I want to know if you'd be interested in selling your house, or hey, I just sold a house recently in your area and I have additional buyers. You know, you're working that kind of system, and you're building it. They're not going to all, even if they raise their hand and say, hey, I want a market analysis. You got, that's, a, that's just a lead. Well, then you got to nurture that lead for the next 3, 6, 12, 15, 20 months for the rest of your life. And to keep in front, if you do that over and over and over and get a system like Mojo or Vulcan 7, you'll crush it. The problem is most people aren't willing to do that. And there's nothing sexy about it, what I just said, which is why most people won't do it. But if you did it for four hours a day, five days a week, go to lunch at 1130, and then in the afternoon you booked appointments, then you kill it. You'd make a million bucks. Well, now I have two questions. <laughs> so, sorry. No, no, um, so, for um, for your. So, are you going to make the phone calls? <laughs> I do that now. Right. I do? have Mojo. There you go. Dollar three dollar yeah. system. Um, what? You got to stay with it. I am. It's hard. It sucks. It takes rejection. It sucks. <laughs> but if it was easy, we'd all get paid seven bucks an hour and do it. You yeah. don't want it to be easy because then everybody would do it. Yeah. You want it to be hard. And then figure out the tricks and you know, study the study it. So my next question leads into that. The scripts, are you big into script practicing and role playing and all that? And like Diana Kokoska, mm -hmm. her scripts. Oh yeah, we have. So we have our team has a coach, um, and he, we bring him into town eight times a year, and then he does uh, virtual coaching with us on a weekly basis. He coaches all my sales managers, and they do script practice almost every day. It's almost every day. And do you think that everybody was jumping up and down like, God, I can't wait to get it out. I mean, you're talking seasoned people who sell 100 houses a year. They think they don't need it. But we made everybody. 
And guess what happened? In about a 60-day period, our conversion, because when we said, hey, our goal in 2017 is conversion. That's the only thing we want to focus on one number. We're going to simplify our business and focus on one number, and that's conversion. And so we hired this coach, and we brought all these scripts and all this training and did all this stuff. And in about 75 days, our conversions doubled. Doubled. That's like free money. We already had the business. We just got the salespeople better. Why? Because of scripts, dialogues, focus, pressure. So. And then, so whenever you were talking about farming and postcards, how did you identify where you wanted to start? Like, how did you determine the inventory turnover? Did you go through the inventory turnover rate? I and... didn't. But, but, but what I really did was, well, so I learned from a guy, if you find your niche, you'll be rich. I'll remember that statement forever. If you find your niche, you'll be rich. And so I said, how can I be different? If I'm competing with her for a listing, how can I be different? And so what I did was I worked for a builder called Colony Homes, which later became a public company, literally like a Pulte, and I became the Colony Homes resale expert. I knew every floor plan, I knew every product, I knew every specification, I knew every single thing about every house they ever built. You couldn't compete with me. If I called, if I called Jeff and say, oh, you had an Avalon, oh, 2,286 square foot, what's A, B, C, D, I mean, what version? And I was so good at that that they would want to list with me. And so I just found that niche, and they were, you know, they were all in good areas like Woodstock, Alpharetta, South Forsyth, uh, Duluth, Lawrenceville. I mean, they were in awesome areas, Canton, and it worked. So you focused on the builder, not I found the code. niche. Okay. So you, whatever you, you could be geographical niche, you could be sorry your kid's school. You can you name your you have to find your niche. It could be, you know, people from your high school. It could be geographical is the easiest. You know, I'm the you know, Virginia Highland special, whatever, whatever you want it to be. And because you want to you niche yourself and get that position so you own the position. And then when you own that position, then you go to the next position. You always want to, it's a great book called Positioning that you could read and it teaches you about it. I mean, it's a really, it's, it's, it's an awesome book on marketing. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello. Awesome. Hi. My name is Christy with Leaders Realty, and I'm glad I'm here. I'm actually inspired, so thank you. But my question is, I've heard you mention the top three real estate people who seem to be all men. What type of advice would you give for a woman like me who's ready to work hard, work smart, I find without a woman losing the family? Because I hear you work, you work late, and I want to be there for this game and for that track meet. And I also hear you talk about hiring people to do certain things. But then I feel, don't I need to, to have my niche first so that the people I'm sending my hires to are able to trust them? Like, what type of advice would you give? So, so, where, so where are you from? Where am I from? Yeah. Atlanta? Yeah, oh. yeah where do you live now? In Decular. Decula. So you could, be, you could become the Decula resale specialist, and you own the market Decula. Or... Evergreen in the Appalachia, which is where I first sold houses okay. in Dacula. Back then they call it Dacula. Um, and you just, you know every house in, in, in that neighborhood and you own that neighborhood. Every time a house comes on the market, you preview it, you look at it, you study it, you become the very best and you own that, you own that niche or you become everything on, De, you know, Dacula Road or everything on the Appalachia Golf Course. You could become the Appalachia Golf Course Specialist. You, you just have to find, and find a niche. Um, if I could have found a woman to mentor me, I would have. My wife would have probably killed me, but because uh, you were talking about she, her question was, you probably didn't hear it. She, it was just basically like all my all my mentors were were men, and I'm, you know, um, but the, there there are plenty of successful business women too. I mean, it's not. I mean, the, the, the lady who runs this Rawls Group right now, she's a, she's an amazing woman. Um, there, there are lots of female leaders out there. You just have to you have to find them. You got to get yourself out there to to, to just look for them. Yeah, Barbara Corcoran. I mean, she's one of the most successful women in the world. I mean, she's you know, Shark Tank. And she has a great, read the book Shark Tales. She's an amazing story on how a woman came from nothing in, a, in the most competitive real estate market in the world, Manhattan, and she crushed it. Sold her company for $50 million to NRT, which is Realogy. Um, but find your niche. You know, and, you don't, and if, you, if you read the book, the one thing, there, there's, a, there's a little synopsis, a little story in there about a woman who had kids. And it talked about like how her life balances and how she struggled because in general, I'm talking kind of like the big rocks of like what, what maybe most people were in my world, what I could do. But there, there's a story in there that would be really cool for you to read that talks about how the lady had to, like where she had to find her balance. 
Does that, that help? Uh, right here. Um, my question to you is, I'm a, probably a lot younger than a lot of people in here, but like, what's a book? Even, I'm the youngest. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take an insult with that. <laughs> to really start me to like begin my journey of like, you know, life and like to get a foot in the door, what book could I use? Or what, what's the first book I could read to start, to, to give me a jump start and to give me the go ahead? Uh, um, my first book at 14 was The Psychology of Winning by Dennis Whaley. I think it's an awesome book today. I give it to a lot of people that work for me. Um, I, you know, there's a great book called 12 Pillars by Jim Rohn. It's a great book. It's a story that kind of talks about like a guy's journey of success, but it's more of a story format. Um, anything by Anthony Robbins. Um, you could Google what's the top 10 business books? What's the top 10 books? I mean, you, you name these, you, you'll find all these lists of like Bill Gates' top 10 books, Warren Buffett's top 10 books. Um, but just find a book that, are you a big reader now? Uh, not really. Most people would say no, but in the group they'd say yes. But, um, just start simple so you, so you do it. And don't kill yourself thinking you're gonna read two hours a day. I mean, start out with like 15 minutes. And then your, your brain's a muscle, so then the next week do 20 minutes. And, then do, and if you don't love to read, then do it on Audible. I mean, you can almost find most books for free, but, you know, five, six, ten bucks. Audible.com, which is connected to Amazon. Um, this is a free book if you want to download it. It's called The Go-Giver. The Go um, it just talks about, it's just, these are just little stories about success and people who came from nothing and made it. It's free on Amazon.com. That helps? Just, yeah, that helps. Just be respectful of time. Um, yep. We may have time for one more question. Yeah, whatever. Oh. Hey, hello. Hey, hey, Mark. Um, hey. So I started real estate three years ago. Uh, I'm coming up on my broker's exam, and um, I've been lucky because I have no shortage of mentors and coaches. I have builders in my family. I have top producing agents make 180k in commissions a year, flippers, brokers, you name it. So I've been so ADD when it comes to learning from all these people. I finally worked my way up to flipping my own houses, just put one under contract. Anyways, I just wanted to ask you, pick your brain, what would you do in that type of scenario? How would, you know, how would you take it to the next yeah, level? Yeah, so I would just, I would like, you know, I think you can learn from everybody, but sometimes it's better to go deep on a relationship versus shallow. It's all, I mean, I'm a, I'm a big go deep on something, just, you know, same thing in, in a lot of aspects of your life. But find that person who you can most relate to, somebody who can really spend. It's one thing to just kind of talk in conversational mode, but there's another thing to say, hey, I need you to mentor me. This is where I'm weak. This is where I need help at. And then really to get a really good, deep relationship, you've got to get vulnerable. You've got, to kind of, you've got to expose who you are as a person so that person can help lift you to that next level. And just find out, just find out what you're missing. And people in your family will know who you are better than you. And if you said, hey, what do you think I need to work on most? Put sensitivity aside for a minute. They will hurt your feelings. But that's how you grow, man. If somebody loves you, I mean, my dad can hurt my feelings, and trust me. But my dad loves me, and I know he's wanting to get me to the other side. Gary Keller could hurt my feelings, but he could get me going to where I needed to be because I'd been transparent enough, and I gave them permission to be honest with me. That, that, that's, the role I, that's the way I would do it. And then when you get to that next level, I mean, Mentors aren't going to last forever. It's, it's usually a couple year ride, and then you got to go to the next level. Sometimes it's like a coach. Sometimes a coach, a business coach, won't last more than 18 months. So, like, just a second part of that question. So, it's like, all right, I'm passionate about real estate in general. Would you just stick to one thing, or would you just kind of do everything like a Russell Westbrook and do a triple double? <laughs> or would you. You know, before I mean, you I, even said it, I was going to say, best advice I can give you, dude, is just go base <laughs> hits. You don't need any grand slams. You will go broke. Trust okay. me, it's not sexy. Yeah. Don't go for sexy. Okay. Seriously, remember what I'm saying. Base hits. About 10, 15 percent margins. So just be. Don't try to just flip the million dollar house. So just Please. get good at one thing, and just boom. Find one thing to be the very, 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 very best at the one thing. All right. I mean, Michael Jordan went to baseball. Yeah, There's a couple of people that went and did some other things and tried it because they needed to in their head, but they really weren't that great at it. Pick one thing 
and become the very best at that one thing, and that's it. Just like good lawyers. Good lawyers aren't trying to practice 17 different kinds of law. They practice the very best, do one thing. The litigators only litigate. The DUI guys only do DUIs. Make sense? I appreciate it. And, and be disciplined. I know your personality. You can get out of the <laughs> <laughs> Don't chase sexy, man. You'll go broke. <laughs> All right. Well, Mark, I wanted to be respectful of your time, but I mean, we can still, once we wrap up, if, yeah. if you have time, you can stick around. But sure. um, I just want to personally thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you coming. Thank you for coming out. Yeah.